Great, thank you for that introduction and thanks to um, BAA for inviting me to come and give some talks. So what I want to talk about today is around the use of hearing aids and combination devices and perhaps some guides, lines to how we might get the best out of these particular uh, methods of managing tinnitus. So the objectives of today's presentation are to discover what the role of these types of devices are in tinnitus therapy, uh, learn how we can use them and how they actually provide their therapeutic benefit, and hopefully to begin to discuss how we can individually select these devices and go about really um, customising how we provide tinnitus therapy for the individuals that we see. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to structure this around a, a model of tinnitus that we published some time ago, which is designed to describe and discuss how the magnitude of tinnitus comes about. And this is called the Adaptation Level Theory of Tinnitus. It's a psychoacoustic model of tinnitus perception, not a neurophysiological model. So it differs from um, some other models that are out there. And it's part of an ecological model of tinnitus which describes how we perceive tinnitus within our daily environment. Um, because of the nature of the talk and the amount of time that I have, I'm going to focus in on this particular relationship between tinnitus perception, the perception of sound in our environment and how that competes with tinnitus, is something that we call residual factors, which account for those non-physical aspects of tinnitus perception related to memory, arousal, and also importantly, a personality of individuals. Now to simplify things, I'm going to present this triangle and um, essentially the relationship between external sound, be it quiet, be it sound that we present through different devices, tinnitus, and psychosocial factors which can contribute both to the perception of tinnitus, but also influence strongly our perception of the sounds that we try and use to manage tinnitus, which is a dimension that often goes um, not looked at when people consider tinnitus therapy. Now there are many things that can potentially contribute to the benefit of hearing aids and tinnitus management, including psychosocial benefit, uh, socialisation, improvement in hearing and so on. But what I want to focus on is masking effects from tinnitus. And the reason why I'm going to uh, concentrate on that is because we've found that this is probably the single most significant contributor to the benefits that individuals actually achieve with hearing aids and why they don't achieve benefit with hearing aids but may achieve benefit with combination devices. So here are three uh, trials that I've been involved in. Each of the black Diamonds or squares represents an individual that's received uh, hearing aids. So <clears throat> anything that falls below the line here is an improvement in tinnitus over a period of time. This is over 12 months, uh, this is 12 months, uh, this is six months, all right, three different studies. Just so you know what these open symbols are on this study here, those are individuals that just received counselling and did not receive hearing aids. In this study, individuals received hearing aids and no counselling. Now, there are some individuals that receive strong benefit from hearing aids. Put a hearing aid on them, you see them, they do really well. Why is that compared to why do we see individuals who perhaps become worse with hearing aids or at least don't show any benefit? Because if we can pull out those people and identify why they're not doing well with hearing aids, then we can do something differently which is going to improve the efficiency 
of our practice and also help those people not follow an avenue that's not going to be successful for them. Now, <clears throat> referring back to this particular study, we were able to break these individuals up into three categories. Those people, when we first fitted them with hearing aids, so I put the hearing aids on, when they had the hearing aids on, they could not hear their tinnitus. Okay? Hearing aids on, no tinnitus. So a tinnitus was masked by the fitting of hearing aids. There were those individuals who we put the hearing aids on and there was no change in their tinnitus whatsoever. And a third group who had the hearing aids on, they could still hear their tinnitus, but it was diminished. All right, they achieved partial masking. And what we can see is over a 12-month period here, those who at the appointment did not hear their tinnitus with the hearing aids in, it was masked, showed the greatest improvement in tinnitus-related quality of life. Those individuals who did not achieve any masking did not achieve any benefit in quality of life. In regard to their tinnitus, even though the hearing aids were helping for their hearing, right? So the hearing aids were fitted, it was helping them socialise, interact with the environment. The difference between these groups was the fact that one group had masking and another did not. The third group that had partial masking showed an intermediate level of improvement. So some of the arguments around how hearing aids help tinnitus, where the argument is it's the counselling that's provided, or it's the fact that people hear better and feel better about their hearing, this result would suggest it's a third factor, in fact. It's a psychophysical interaction with the tinnitus. It's about making tinnitus less audible. That is the main effect. Now, what's interesting between those three groups is they can be differentiated on the basis of the audiogram. Those individuals fitted with hearing aids who had good low-frequency hearing were more likely to have their tinnitus masked and therefore more likely to have an improvement in their quality of life than those individuals that had poor or low frequency hearing. And we're not talking about really bad low frequency hearing, all right? It's just outside of normal hearing range. But if you fit a hearing aid to this group, you are less likely to achieve masking, less likely to interfere with tinnitus perception, and less likely to achieve long-term improvement in quality of life. Now, what's not shown in this diagram, but we also showed in the study, was if tinnitus pitch was within the fitting range of the hearing aid, just based simply on looking at the hearing aid spec sheets and the frequency range that was provided, if the tinnitus was within that frequency range, you were much more likely to achieve masking than if it was outside of that frequency range. So tinnitus pitch and tinnitus masking actually matter. Right? This is not just about improving quality of life. So if we have individuals that have good low frequency hearing and their tinnitus pitch is within the bandwidth of the hearing aid amplification, they are likely to do well with hearing aids. Those that have slightly poorer low frequency hearing or whose tinnitus pitch was outside, typically it's going to be higher frequency, are going to do less well. Now, the argument around this is <clears throat> our ability to successfully, comfortably amplify environmental sound. When we have good low frequency hearing, it's normal, it's very easy for us to put a hearing aid on and to provide amplification within that region to essentially boost uh, low intensity sounds. Even when we have a little bit of low frequency hearing loss, it becomes more difficult to boost the quiet sounds in our environment 
that we normally consider as background noise and we want to filter out. Right? It's just easier to do. So this is a diagram that I use quite often to illustrate um, the effect of hearing aids on tinnitus. Uh, I want you to imagine that this cricket here represents the individual's tinnitus, the sound within the person's head. This background is the background sound in our environment. Now, in this case, we have normal hearing and we hear this cricket. All right. If we have a hearing loss, effectively what we are doing is filtering out some of the energy in our picture. All right. So we're taking away some of the background activity which would normally interfere with our tinnitus, but because tinnitus is an internal sound, it is there, it's very clear. So what we have is a signal relative to noise, and the cricket stands out very clearly from that. When we fit hearing aids, what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce the contrast or the, in this case, the visibility of the internal representation. So this is a useful diagram for um, people that have had tinnitus and can't really understand why we'd want to fit hearing aids. It's about making the tinnitus more difficult to detect against background activity. The more interesting that background activity, the easier it is going to be to interfere with the tinnitus because we are applying our cognitive resources to actually make sense of our background environment. And we, when we do that, there are less cognitive reserves available to think about the tinnitus. Now, <clears throat> There are going to be situations uh, where the individual has low frequency hearing, where we would, in our clinic, automatically fit combination devices because we believe that it's highly likely that hearing aids alone are not going to be effective. And while I've got this up here, it's fair to say that almost every study that has compared hearing aids to combination devices has found no difference. You know? They're equally effective. They're going to be equally effective if you are fitting them to the same population because the hearing aid is so effective that when you are trying to compare it to a combination device, there's very little room to improve. But if you actually fit the combination devices to a group that is not going to benefit from hearing aids, then you are going to see this difference. And this is a big problem with the randomised controlled trials that exist there. They're fitted to the same population, so you're not going to see a difference in the groups. Sound effects. I think everybody that's uh, familiar with tinnitus will know that if a person experiences tinnitus and they're uh, having some emotional upset, that that's going to make their tinnitus worse. And there's often a chicken and egg scenario where we don't know whether the emotional upset came before the tinnitus or the tinnitus became before the emotional upset. We undertook a study where we actually provided sound that we knew was going to have a negative effect and we provided sounds that we knew were going to have a positive effect. There's a library of sounds, an international library, which are designed to evoke uh, emotions. There's a, a visual equivalent, so um, the visual equivalent's easier to describe. You'll see an image of someone that is, is hung, all right? Or they've had an arm amputated and it's a, a wound, all right? The sort of thing that wouldn't make it into the newspaper, all right? And then you have lovely pictures of people holding babies that make you, you smile. And these are used in psychological experiments to change the emotional state of an individual. So rather than relying on seeing individuals that were upset, we upset them, all right? And saw how that actually affected their tinnitus. And what we found is a slight gender difference, 
But overall, uh, auditory stimuli, so positive sounds, laughter, post negative sounds, crying or screaming, had a positive effect on tinnitus, the screaming had a negative effect. The visual stimuli, which we thought would have an effect because tinnitus is related to emotion, had no effect. So it appears that some of the emotional response interacting with tinnitus is confined to the auditory domain. It is not influenced so much by visual information. Uh, most of the changes that we saw in, in females and in males related to how they would rate the loudness of their tinnitus, but we also saw an effect in tinnitus related to distress. So having a think about this and how this actually may influence what we do in the clinic, we can introduce a sound but if that sound itself is negative to the individual, what it will do is just drive attention to the tinnitus. So simply using a sound to interfere with tinnitus is not going to be effective because it will potentially have a negative effect on those factors which will target and focus our attention more on tinnitus. So we do have to decide on the sounds that we use that are going to be positive. And we can have a look at this. Um, this is a study looking at broadband noise where we increase the level of sound from threshold to the minimum masking level. So this is a percentage scale. Uh, everything has been normalised to 0 to 100. Now what we normally think about is as we increase the level of sound, we are going to expect the annoyance of the tinnitus to decrease, okay? Which is good. So as we increase the level of sound, the annoyance of tinnitus goes down. What we don't often think about is that as we increase the level of sound, the annoyance of the sound that we are playing is going to increase as well. If we determine that these have equal weightings, then in particular, in this particular case, we essentially end up with equal annoyance across a group of individuals um, when we actually average the tinnitus annoyance with the annoyance of the sound that we are introducing. So what we need to think about is finding a sound that reduces tinnitus annoyance while the annoyance of the sound itself main is maintained at a low level. Right? Ideally, we want a rapid decline in tinnitus with an increase in the level of sound, but a very slow increase in the annoyance of the sound that we are in fact using to interfere with tinnitus. So this is from another study, um, a similar graph here, tinnitus annoyance, sound annoyance for broadband noise. Right? This is for a surf sound. Right? This was a simulated surf sound. Many of the combination devices that are now available have these sorts of sound. And what you can see is we get this reduction in tinnitus, which is equivalent to what we see with broadband noise, but the growth and the annoyance of the tinnitus sound is less. So it would seem, at the face of it, that using a sound like this is going to be more beneficial than a sound like this. However, um, it does depend a lot on the individual. One minute left, Grant. Great, thanks. So what we're trying to do here is, if we use a particular sound that is pleasant, we can drive it, our attention towards an external sound while minimalizing the uh, psychosocial domain's attention towards tinnitus. Now, what I showed you there was an acute change in tinnitus, where we're looking at the ratings and seeing what the effect is. When we look long term, we can see one of a number of different effects. This is a study that we looked at where we used nature sounds. These were recordings of nature sounds, actual nature sounds streamed to hearing aids. In this case, this was broadband noise. 
And what I think we see when we use different stimuli is one is a sound-related effect, which is a stepwise step down. This is after three months, but I think that actually if we measured it, we would see this almost immediately. And we see a more long-term change that is related to a psychological dimension. I'd have to say, however, again, that the results are quite variable because in another study where we've compared broadband noise with nature sounds, uh, broadband noise was far more effective and, uh, in reducing the tinnitus magnitude. So we need to understand this relationship a little bit more. Now, a couple of slides just to wrap up. This is what we apply in our clinic. Um, here we've got an audiogram, all right, and if the person has hearing that falls within the blue range, such as within this audiogram here, we'd quite happily fit a hearing aid and believe that that alone would result in a significant reduction in tinnitus. In this case here, we would fit a combination device. If it falls within this, this white region, it's probably a decision based on the person's reaction to any sound that we would introduce. If they fall into this red region down here, it becomes more difficult to actually use a combination device because the level of sound that we are presenting in order to be audible is quite loud. So sound therapy using combination devices or hearing aids becomes very difficult in this red area and also in this high frequency area here. This gray area, cochlear implants, all right? If they have a hearing loss in this area, we really don't try and manage their hearing, uh, their tinnitus with hearing aids or combination devices. Doesn't mean it won't work, but the likelihood is less. If the tinnitus is very high frequency, then the likelihood that tinnitus will be of benefit is reduced, although we have trialled some devices that produce broadband noise and hearing aids up to 16 kilohertz, and that can extend the fitting range. The other thing that we use is to try and identify the goals of the individual uh, as we are going through the fitting process. And this enables us to very much, well, to try and customise what we are doing to the individual patient that we are seeing. So this is the COSY, which many of you might be familiar with, all right? Uh, but it's altered in a way that is designed for tinnitus. So the COSIT, the COSY for tinnitus, is directed towards identifying tinnitus-related goals, setting importance, and then trying to come up with a management plan that is directed towards those particular goals. So that's my presentation for today. Um, there are a lot more layers to the hearing aid fitting process uh, that we haven't had time to talk about, but the most significant element, we believe, is whether when you put the hearing aids on in the clinic the first time, the individual notices a significant change in their tinnitus. If they don't, we don't believe that they're going to see long-term benefits from hearing aids. Thank you. Okay? Thank you.